for this conference, we asked um, the former Chief Justice of our province, who's now a distinguished um, jurist in residence at the University of Manitoba Faculty of Law, the Honourable the Honorable Richard Scott, to uh, be a rapporteur for our conference and reflect on what it is that we've heard, um, some of the big questions that arise, uh, what his understanding of what has been shared uh, has been. And so uh, I, I'd like to uh, thank him uh, for agreeing to take on that very important role and also um, introduce him. The uh, Honourable Richard Scott is, a, as I said, a distinguished jurist in residence at the University of Manitoba and he was named Queen's Counsel in 1976, President of the Law Society of Manitoba from 1983 to 84. He was appointed to the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench in 1985, and a few months later, he became um, the um, Associate Chief Justice. Now, in 1990, he was appointed Chief Justice of Manitoba, the uh, pre presiding judge of our Court of Appeal. He's made special contributions to the work of the Canadian Judicial Council through its committees on judicial independence and conduct. And while at the bar, uh, Justice Scott worked extensively with Legal Aid Manitoba and has participated in programs to assist the judiciary in the development of the rule of law in Ethiopia and Ukraine. Please join me in welcoming uh, Richard Scott. Thank you, Amy. Can you all hear me okay? okay. Um, Amy and I are um, in adjacent offices here at the law school, so when she contacted me a couple of weeks ago and asked me if I would undertake this task, I was honored and pleased. Um, I'm still honored, but I confess a little nervous. Um, in all the years that, that I was a judge, which amounts to almost 28 years, reasons that I can't explain, we don't sum up after seminars. And I've been to literally dozens and dozens of seminars for judges and so on over the years, and uh, we just don't sum up. And in the, the courts of, of Manitoba, the trial courts and, and the court of appeal, um, certainly in my time, we have never had a, a case dealing with it, treaty issues um, we had two cases that I recall involving Métis, um, Blay, a Métis hunting case in which Jean Taille appeared before our court, and of course the Métis land claim. So I, I confess to being just, just a little nervous, so please bear with me. Um, I'm not going to um, talk in any specific detail about either Kiwaitin or Chilcotin. We've been listening to literally nothing else for the last day and a half, and I assume, therefore, um, that we have a working familiarity by this time with the two cases. Um, obviously, I can't cover everything, and by definition, um, my talk, my comments are going to be legalistic, because that's the nature of my task, and that's my background as a judge. I've divided my topic into five parts. Um, I started off with the first three, um, entitling them the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, that really isn't accurate, particularly after uh, listening to the very helpful comments from Bill Gallagher and Jean Taillet this morning. But I'm going to stay with, with the threefold classification. One, the good news. One, the uh, maybe good news, maybe not and the third, uh, the comments and concerns that we heard yesterday and again today uh, when we really drilled down into uh, the Chilcotin and the Kiwaitin decisions. Um, fourth category, the most interesting presentations and uh, without question that's Ovid Mercredes and Doug Whites and I'll have a few things to say about that and then uh, a little bit at the end, uh, time permitting, about the role of the courts because um, I felt at the end of things yesterday that um, the courts were getting beat up a little bit. Um, not that we do things perfectly, but on the other hand, um, now I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, we, we are still the only game in town when it comes to the presentation and enforcement of indigenous rights. 
But my, my job has been made much easier by uh, Bill Gallagher and Jean Taillet's comments this morning. So without further ado, let's get started with the, the good, the really good. Um, Mr. Wilson started off yesterday talking about um, Kiwetan and Chilkutin in particular, that they had changed the psychology out there in terms of dealing with indigenous issues. He referred to um, the, two, the combination of the two cases as resulting in the passing of an era. He noted they were all about policy. Then Mr. James, who was counsel in the Kiwetan case, of course, got into the act, um, again talked about the presence of policy um, stated as such in the court's decision. And Amy had something to say about that later, and I'll come back to that. Consultation was the magic word for true consensual negotiation. A little later, um, we noted um, during the comments later on about Chilkutin by Ms. Mahoney that the trial judge, and this is a very interesting point, considered the issues in Chilkotin from the Aboriginal perspective. And that, I think, is a real breakthrough. Ms. Blackhawk um, pointed out, as did Doug White, that in, in Chilkotin, the, the court finally um, actually made a specific ruling um, confirming title on, on the part of the indigenous group um, that was concerned in that particular litigation, although, as was noted, the actual extent of the territory is still unclear. There's an issue about whether it's 2,000 acres or 1,750 acres, and as Jean Taille noted this morning, there are in fact six aboriginal bands within the territory, uh, which may well make for some difficult governance issues. Ms. Mahoney and Ms. Blackhawk both pointed out an obvious fact, but worth um, emphasizing again, that all of these cases are evidence-based, and hence the 339 days of, of evidence in, in Chilcotin, um, MMF didn't take that long. I think it was about three months. Um, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that the lawyers scoured the world looking for the appropriate and relevant documents, which shortened things considerably. And then uh, one thing I've often wondered about is why we haven't seen um, many of these issues um, in Manitoba dealing with, with treaty issues. And perhaps Mr. Anderson gave us a clue in the last um, presentation yesterday. It seems that Manitoba resource people go out of their way to try and consult, to try and work in harmony with, with the northern communities. And that is um, obviously a good thing. And then, of course, um, we heard today from both Bill Gallagher and Jean Taillet, Bill's point being that uh, Kiwetan should be regarded as a win and not a loss. Um, I'm not going to repeat the points that he made because they're, they're of course, very fresh in our minds. Um, but he certainly made a, a very compelling argument. And then Jean Taillet's comments, particularly about Chilcotin, um, which I personally found very compelling, and that is that it's a new world out there. Certain governmental organizations may not have woken up to the fact yet, but it is. The Crown owns a lot less land, and the cost of consent, and there's that word again, consent, that Doug White emphasized so strongly in his remarks yesterday. There's that word again. The cost of consent has gone up. And to quote Gene, it's just stupid not for the government to get it. Well, uh, we'll find out in due course, Gene. The, uh, 
may be good, may be bad, <laughs> um, really um, doesn't take up very much room in my notes at all. And the first part that I've gone over now was maybe about a page of notes, what I'm about to talk about now even less. And of course, the third part, the <laughs> what are the questions that arise from these decisions is about three times the length of the others put together. And that's the nature of the beast, because when the Supreme Court pronounces as they have, particularly with these two cases, and Gene would say three cases, more or less in tandem, um, obviously academics, judges, and lawyers are going to be going through the decisions paragraph by paragraph, trying to look for not only the meaning for that particular case, but more importantly, and that's why we're here, what are the lessons for us for the future? So without further ado, let's talk about the, the questions, um, most of which were um, dealt with and, and discussed yesterday. Um, Mr. Jaynes, who was counsel in the Kiwaitan case, noted that, and of course that was the case that raised the issue of in, squarely of interjurisdictional immunity, that ultimately, in his view, the case stands for the fact that the promise of the crown is ultimately from government and the level of government is irrelevant. He pointed out that more litigation is inevitable, to which I'd say, meaning no disrespect to him, duh. Uh, <laughs> the lack of interjurisdictional immunity reduces the rights of indigenous peoples, in his view, and the Supreme Court should not be dealing um, with policy issues in that context. The two cases, now he's talking about Chilcotin as well, take away a good part of the section 9124 and, and the in, protection of interjurisdictional immunity, leaving the bad part namely the Indian Act. I thought that was a very interesting comment. Heather Leonoff for the province um, pointed out the obvious, namely that as a result of the decisions in Chilcotin and Kiwaitan, that the province can enact laws that incidentally impact on indigenous peoples and can take up the land subject to provisions of section 35 and the duty to act honorably. Well. We'll see about that. Kent McNeil, uh, again, also pointed out that the decision in Chilcotin actually removes the protection of interjurisdictional immunity, which, of course, is not subject to the justification test under Sparrow. He posed a question, do the provinces have obligations as well as rights? and pointed out an anomaly that, that he and Gene and I were discussing just a few moments before we reconvene, namely um, Canada supported the province's um, request for jurisdiction in Kiwaitan. Why would they do that? And a suggestion has been made, and that's because ultimately the government of Canada wants to get out of the Aboriginal business and leave that responsibility with the provinces who of course are now responsible, have the constitutional responsibility and ownership over resources um, in Ontario and other many other provinces um, from Confederation and in the Western provinces after 1930 and the Natural Resources Transfer Act. Julie Blackhawk um, also had reservations about marrying up Section 33 and the Section 1 proportionality um, process, and I'll come back to that when I review what Amy told us later in, on in the afternoon. She also suggested, um, somewhat controversially, I think, that Kiwaitan also stands for the proposition that the Aboriginal communities can, cannot sit on demonstrably beneficial development forever. 
Now the question I asked myself at the time is, who says it's demonstrably beneficial development? So um, that's an interesting concept, and one that the uh, courts are undoubtedly going to have to wrestle with in the years to come. Amy Kraft um, was the last speaker but one yesterday afternoon and entitled her talk, Impoverished Understandings and Perpetration of Myths. With respect to Chilcotin, she was concerned, as were others, about the marrying up of the justification test with the Section 1 proportionality mantra. She worried whether the land -like rights would survive treaty rights. There now seems to be a chasm between treaty and non-treaty rules and rights. As for Kiwaitin, she said that it was clear from Kiwaitin that there should be a standard for consultation. There should be rules. There should be a process that everybody understands and accepts and is prepared to abide by um, when it comes to consultation. She was puzzled that there was no mention of the Aboriginal perspective in Kiwaitin as there was in Chilcotin, and wondered how did the court in Kiwaitin determine the spirit of the original treaty in the absence of that perspective. Again, the balancing of rights approach was suspect, and in her concluding remark, she noted that what was needed was to recognize Aboriginal rights, not to simply interpret them. And finally, in passing, she, note, she made note of the fact that there was no reference and no use of the phrase reconciliation in Kiwaitin. So while the two cases parallel each other and, and sit well together in some respects, there are certainly um, some significant distinctions between the two of them. And then today um, we heard from both um, Bill Gallagher and Jean Taye more about Kiwaitin. As I've said, Kiwaitin um, being regarded as, as in reality a win for the Aboriginal community. And Jean's comment, which I've already referred to, which is that Chilcotin, properly understood in all its ramifications, really is has the potential to be a game changer for, um, for us, for everybody in this country, when, but only when, the government comes to the table, which hasn't happened yet. So, what were the most interesting presentations yesterday? Well, I thought there were two. The first by Ovid Mercury, um, and I'm, I'm going to quote a bit from his comments. Um, I found them very interesting. He said that Canadian law is offside. Treaties should not be de defined by Canadian law. We cannot define our rights in their, meaning the ROC's, legal system. He talked about the situation in New Zealand where they have a treaty commission consisting of three representatives of the broader New Zealand community, three, three representatives of the Witenge, and a chairman selected by, by the six. Um, and let me deal with that now. I, that's a very interesting concept. And if we were working off a blank sheet of paper, it might have some real attractions. But we're not working off a blank sheet of paper. And New Zealand, which is a small country with no wilderness, no remote areas, anything like what we have over the vast majority of our country, I really question whether a concept uh, like that would work, but again, this is all academic OV because um, we already have a process which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Despite Section 9124, he said, 
the treaties do not distinguish the sovereignty of the Aboriginal peoples. Um, he wistfully th talked about the Charlottetown Accord, which would have created the Aboriginals as a third level of government had it been accepted. And finally, he simply pointed out, and I think that, that this resonated with everybody here yesterday, that what the indigenous peoples are simply asking for is to obtain the same rights of governance as the rest of Canada. Doug White, later on in the afternoon, spoke to us. In the broader trajectory of the legal process, um, and again in light of, of Chilcotin in particular and also Kiwaitan, and that this project trajectory of the legal process was the most important issue for the country today given these two decisions, and I think that ties in perfectly with Jean Taillet's comments today about now's the time for everybody to get to the table. What's missing, he said, is the issue of self-determination. Consent, he argued, is part of our law now. His argument was that the Crown override cannot survive the doctrine of consent and reconciliation. And again, we heard a lot about that today from both Jean Taillé and Bill Gallagher. My last few comments, on, and I, again, I can truncate these because of, of Bill and, and Jean's comments this morning, is to talk a little bit about the court system. We, we here in this country, in North America, and in most of the former areas of the British Empire, are part of the common law system. And the common law system, in contrast to the investigatory system that exists in continental Europe, and frankly, most of the rest of the world, is adversarial and works incrementally. England, with its history and traditions, does not have a written constitution. There are many people who feel that it should, but they don't think it's necessary because of their centuries of tradition. The common law, judge-made law, and formed by statutory law, constitutional documents, and uh, regulations, is the genius of the common law system. And because it works incrementally, sometimes it can be slow and almost glacial in the way in which it develops new, new legal principles. But I was very heartened to uh, hear from Bill Gallagher today that the success rate for the indigenous peoples in their litigation in BC is 90%. That's an astonishing figure. If an individual lawyer had a success rate like that, they'd be down on Wall Street uh, making themselves a heck of a living. Um, so, I, and, and again, Jean Taillé, uh, with her comments about the three cases, including MMF, um, indicated pretty clearly that the place, and this, it's an unfortunate comment, on our democracy as it exists today, that the place where indigenous rights have succeeded, almost without exception, there have been some notable exceptions, but almost without exception, is in the courts, and in particular in the Supreme Court of Canada. So I come back to the comment I made at the beginning. The courts are not perfect. You're not going to win any time. It's slow. 330 some odd days of trial in, in Chilcotin. A lot of money. But in the end, it's the best we can do. And for this area of law, for the rights and the interests and the desires of our indigenous peoples, it's the best thing we've got. And with, with one last comment, with, with the greatest of respect to those people who 
look to another jurisdiction, to the United Nations, to some North American group to help resolve our problems. I know of no country on earth that has willingly given up jurisdiction over its own peoples. The closest that came to was in England when in, as part of the EU process they agreed that in human rights matters that the, the decisions of what used to be called the House of Lords, now I think the Supreme Court of England, could proceed to the European Commission on Human Rights. Well, a couple of con controversial decisions have come down from the European Commission Court of Human Rights which have disagreed with the Supreme Court of England and there's a great hue and cry now to yank the jurisdiction back from the European <laughs> Court of Human Rights. So stay tuned on that one. But international law and the, our Supreme Court has been very good about this. International law is taken into account by the Supreme Court in many of their decisions and, and is, informs the court's view about Canadian law. But I don't think we'll ever see the day when international law as such overrides the domestic law of this country. And I think that's the same for just about every other country on this planet. Those are my comments. I hope you find them helpful and useful. Again, I, I'm very pleased to have been invited to participate, and I welcome your questions in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, generous summary of, of the perspectives that were put forward yesterday. We're going to... Uh, to follow up on that and launch into some big questions with uh, Peter Hutchins, who's going to lead us off for about 10 minutes on some reflections uh, relating to the big questions that arise. <laughs>